So you want to become an airline pilot. Let's go over these six simple steps. Well, maybe not simple, but let's go over these six steps so that you can become an airline pilot as well. Step one is the flight school. You need to research your flight school, figure out whether, figure out what flight schools you have in your area and what programs they offer. You know, don't be afraid to look outside of your immediate area for a flight school. I say this because if you live in say the Northeast or maybe in Denver, that doesn't always get really good weather. You may want to consider moving someplace like California or Arizona temporarily to complete your flight training so that you can get it done faster. The other thing you want to consider is how much is the program and the financing options. Uh, nowadays, I think it's typical to see about a, to see a program cost around hundred thousand dollars and financing options. There are a lot of schools now that give you the ability to finance through banks who specialize in flight loans, uh, who specialize in loans for flight students. So this will help you because it'll be a little bit easier to qualify for a loan of that size when they know that you're going specifically for flight training. Because when I was going through flight training, loans that were special to us were not an option and it made it very difficult to get financing if you didn't have these banks. The third thing you wanna do is research this flight school on YouTube or LinkedIn or just any kind of social media and see if you can find people who used to go to this flight school and ask them, hey, uh, did they stick true to their program? Um, were their aircraft maintained well? Did they have a good pass rate? Just any questions that you have about the flight school, find somebody who can help answer these questions. And the more recently they attended the school, the better. Uh, for example, I went to ATP, but now if you were to ask me questions on ATP, a lot of the information that I have would be irrelevant because my information is several years old. And one of the other things you want to consider when looking at your flight school is you want to look within yourself and figure out what is your best learning style. What I mean by this is some flight schools offer a very fast paced learning environment. For example, ATP is very much a self-study and fast paced learning environment. However, there are other flight schools that are more of a traditional classroom environment. So you need to figure out which one of those options work best for you and then choose a flight school accordingly. And last but not least, one big thing to consider is once you're finished with their flight training, will your flight school offer you a, a employment opportunity after you finish your flight training? There are many flight schools out there that say, hey, once you finish your flight training with us, we'll hire you as a CFI. Now, whether or not you wanna work at that flight school is a whole different story, but it's always nice to have a plan in place in case you need it. Step two is starting flight school. So there's a couple of things that you need to consider when you start flight school. The biggest one being is materials. You're gonna to have to make a pretty significant investment when you first start flight training. Some flight schools will allow you to, to bundle this investment into your flight loan and other times you may be required to take out this money on your own. But the first thing you're most likely gonna need is an iPad. You want an iPad that is capable of connecting to a cellular network because this will allow you to track your location when you use the flight app that you're gonna be using the most for navigation and all your charts. And this app is called For Flight, For Flight, if you want to do some research on it. Uh, if you get an iPad that is not uh, capable of connecting to a cellular network, um, the four flight app will not be able to track your location and just makes it a little bit harder for you to use that app. The second thing you're going to need is a pair of headphones. Now these are really, really, really important. And I may, I would recommend that you invest in the best pair of headphones that you can afford. It is very easy to go onto Amazon and buy a hundred dollar pair of headphones, but they're not going to protect your hearing as well. They're not going to be as good a quality and not going to sound as good. On the flip side of that, there's a very expensive set of headphones that you can get called the uh, Bose uh, A20s. A lot of people wear these, and I think there's even a newer generation of the A20s now. Um, but those can be a thousand and some change just to purchase a pair. Personally, what I do and what I recommend is that you go out and you buy yourself a pair of Bose QC35s. These essentially are normal headphones, Bluetooth uh, capable, that you can use for your day to day activities. And then you can go out and buy the UFly mic kit. This allows you to connect to your QC35s to your airplane and use these headphones for your flight training or any other aircraft that you may fly. So it's the best of both worlds. You get to get a normal pair of headphones. I can't speak. You get to have a normal pair of headphones and then you also get to have a set of aviation headphones all in one headset, I should say, all in one. And the price, depending upon what setup you use and whether or not you buy new or used, you will probably run you somewhere between five and maybe seven hundred dollars, which is a significant saving and it's going to last you a very long time. The other thing you're going to want to get is miscellaneous items such as sunglasses to protect your vision, 
Uh, you may want to invest in a pair of sleeves to kind of protect your skin during flight training. Um, a good backpack and a nice water bottle, especially if you're flight training in an area that's really warm. You're going to want to sell a good water bottle to keep your water insulated because it can get very hot inside of these smaller aircraft because a lot of them do not have air conditioning. Once you have all your materials taken care of, it's good to know what ratings you're going to have to get. You're going to start off with getting your private pilot's license. After that, you're going to get your instrument flight rating. Following that, you'll more than likely get your commercial uh, single engine license, which allows you to get paid to fly aircraft with only one engine. Then you'll get your commercial multi-engine license, which allows you to get paid to fly aircraft with two or more engines. After that, you'll more than likely do your CFI rating, which is your Certified Flight Instructor uh, rating. This allows you to teach people how to fly. Next, you'll have two ratings that I would recommend getting, but I guess could, could, could be considered optional. This is going to be your CFII, your, uh, your Certified Flight Instructor Instrument Rating. This allows you to teach people to get their IFR rating. And the last one that you will want to get, but it's optional, you don't have to, is your MEI. This is your multi-engine uh, instructor. This allows you to teach people to fly aircraft with two or more engines. The more CFI ratings you have, uh, the more competitive you'll be in the marketplace when you're looking for a job. And it just looks better on your resume all around. So step three. You'll want to become, well, after you finish your flight training, you'll either become a CFI or you will go and try to find a job in a part 91 or part 135 operator. But to start, let's talk about the CFI. So you decide to go down the CFI route. Once you're nearing the end of your flight training, start looking around at other flight schools and see if there's any flight schools that better suit your needs as an employee, whether it be better pay, better benefits, interesting aircraft that you want to fly, or just more opportunities to progress through uh, your career and get to higher paid positions such as maybe even a cheap pilot at your flight school, right? So you want to look around and see which one of these flight schools best suits your needs. The next thing that you can do is you can either go work for a part 91 or a part 135 operator. Now, if you're fresh out of flight school with 250 hours, this would be a little bit difficult because it's going to be very hard for you to find, find an employer who is willing to take you at 250 hours. However, it is possible but it will require a lot of networking on your end. So again, as you're approaching the end of your flight training, begin reaching out, really reach out to your contacts on LinkedIn if you made any, or really go out to maybe hiring events in the aviation community and see if there's any employers who are willing to take you at 250 hours. But more than likely, you will be required to at least be a flight instructor for some time to gain enough hours to become competitive in the low time pilot market. So step four, we're assuming now that you're either a CFI or that you've gotten hired at a part 91 or part 135 operator. And now your one and only goal is to build up to 1500 hours as quickly as you possibly can. Getting to 1500 hours will allow you to either one, get hired by a regional airline or two, get hired by a low cost carrier or three, if it's what you're interested in, get hired by an operator such as uh, maybe JSX or net jets or flex jets. Now, when you're building up to 1500 hours, you're gonna hit these milestones. And these milestones will allow you to make, uh, we'll say adjustments in your career path. The first milestone you're gonna hit is 500 hours. This is gonna open up, maybe we'll say this is a circle, you know, this is a circle. We're gonna say it's gonna open up maybe this many jobs for you. Once you get to about 750 hours, that circle is gonna get bigger. You're gonna have more opportunities for different jobs. And then once you get to a thousand hours, more jobs will open up. When you get to about maybe 1250, uh, 1250 hours, you're gonna have some more jobs open up. And then of course, when you get 1500 hours, which is the big milestone, you're gonna have even more jobs open up. So the key is to kind of progress these milestones. And if you are a CFI and you don't like being a CFI and you get to 750 hours, that would be a good time for you to start looking and seeing if there's any operators out there, maybe such as uh, a Mary flight that would be willing to take you on with 750 hours or 500 hours if you don't want to be a flight instructor. The other thing you want to consider is that if you're already at a 135 carrier that operates large jets, okay, or transport category size jets, you may want to consider staying at that operator. Why do I say this? Because when you hit 1500 hours, assuming that you're also at least 23 years old, you may have an opportunity at that carrier to upgrade to captain. And the sooner you upgrade to captain, the sooner you can gain uh, pilot and command time in a jet. 
and that is going to help make your resume to the majors as competitive as possible. So the goal is to get PIC time inside of a transport category jet as soon as possible. That's the goal. Step five, you're gonna need to apply to the regionals, the low cost carriers and any part 135 operators that you, part 135 operators that you're interested in. I'm sorry guys, I, I can't really speak that well today. I'm not too sure why. Anyways, so when you're approaching 1500 hours, you wanna to apply to these uh, operators and really start setting yourself up for success. Make sure that your resume is correctly formatted. That's about the biggest one you can do. And if you've had the opportunity to network, start reaching out to these uh, contacts that you've made and ask them if they have any advice uh, for getting an interview or doing the interview at these regionals or whatever operator that you decide to go for. One little caveat that I will throw in here, and I like to add that this is a completely unproven opinion. It is purely in my opinion, and many recruiters say that it's false. So this is 100% my opinion but I will say it just so that you guys know. In my experience, I have found that you should not work for the regional of the major that you want to work for, okay? So if you want to work for Delta, do not work for Endeavor. And if you wanna work for American, do not work for Envoy. Why? Because it has the potential to hurt the company to pull you from their regional into the majors, right? But it does not hurt, say, Delta to pull you from onboarding. That doesn't impact Delta's operation at all. So it's just something to consider. If you want to work for XYZ major, make sure you don't want to make sure that you do not work for their associated regional airline. Again, just my opinion. Do with that as you please. So now we're on to step six, and this is arguably one of the more important steps in this entire process, because at this point, you're preparing yourself to go on to the, uh, the major airline of your choice or whatever your destination airline is. Now, at this point, you have done all your flight training, you have your 1500 hours, and you have gotten hired at either a regional airline, a low cost carrier, whatever, or whatever part 135 carrier of your choice. And now your primary goal is preparing yourself to go to the major. So step one is obviously fly, right? That's what you have to do. You have to gain your hours. Now, when you finish your training at whatever uh, carrier you get hired on, once you finish that and you have your ATP and you have your type rating in your jet, immediately send out your applications to the majors and keep these applications updated at least monthly. It is very, 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 very important that you update these at least monthly. I would personally recommend updating them maybe weekly or bi-weekly just because it helps the system see that you're committed to trying to get to this airline and that you want to get on. Little things like this, as weird as it may seem, will really help your, your chances of getting hired on. Another thing you can do is go to hiring events. This is a great opportunity to meet recruiters and talk to the people at airlines that you want to be at, or if you're lucky, even do a meet and greet. And when you do these kinds of things, and if you're good at it, what will happen is you'll increase your odds of them pulling your application and getting pulled into a real interview that can get you a job at the major of your choice. When you do get your interview, one of the things that you'll want to invest in, and it's a quite expensive investment, we'll say about $700, is interview prep. If you are really good at interviewing and you know it, you will still want to do interview prep because it'll give you some tips that you may not have thought about that could cost you your job. I know for me personally, I had always felt like I was really good at interviewing and I never had an issue with it. But even so, I still spent the time and the money to go and do some interview prep. For me personally, I did not feel like it was all that helpful but it did give me a couple of tips that I think helped improve my odds a little bit of getting the jobs that I wanted. And for reference, I got hired not only at American Airlines, but I also got hired at Delta Airlines. So, I mean, it, it was a proven strategy that worked both times. On the flip side of that, it would be very, very uh, foolish of you if you know that you're not good at an interview and you're not good at talking to people in business environments, or you're not good at presenting yourself, to not do interview prep because if these are not your strong suits, if this is not your strong suit, if interviewing is not your strong suit, again, I cannot speak today, I don't know why guys. If interviewing is not your strong suit, this will be an excellent opportunity for people to tell you, hey, you need to work on this, you need to work on that, 
your resume needs to be worked on here. You need to do this to make your application look better. You are used wrong terminology here. This is not, this will be a great opportunity for you to get all that handled so that your ducks are in a row when you are trying to get your interview at the majors. The other thing you wanna do is make sure that you are meticulous on all of your paperwork. This is very important. When you're applying to the majors, it's gonna ask for a bunch of information. It's gonna ask for when did you live here? How long did you live there for? Did you have, uh, you know, speeding tickets? Did you, you know, it's just gonna ask for a bunch of information about your life. And it's important that all your dates add up because the system that they use will catch uh, discrepancies in these dates. And that can be a ding to your application. So make sure that all your dates line up. If all goes well, what the majors will do is they'll reach out to you to schedule an interview. Some airlines will have you do an interview first and other airlines will have you do a pre-employment exam first. For example, Delta will have you do a pre-employment exam. This exam is relatively straightforward, but you should practice it first. There are a variety, I wouldn't say a variety, there is a website online that you can use that will prepare you for Delta's pre-employment exam. 100% spend the $20 that you need to spend to prepare for the test because at Delta, this pre-employment test actually matters, okay? So it'd be terrible for you to get the opportunity to do this test and then you fail the test. And if you fail the test, you're not gonna move forward with an interview. The airline is more than likely going to send you very specific instructions on what to do at your interview. And it is critical that you follow these instructions to the absolute T. They are going to be looking at your paperwork with a fine tooth comb. So make sure that they make sure that you do everything exactly the way they tell you to. I cannot stress this enough. When I went through my interview at Delta, I saw numerous people lose the opportunity for a multi-million dollar career because they did not do their paperwork correctly and they did not have their paperwork organized correctly. Now, I will say this as well. At one point, I was also doing pilot interviews at my previous employer. And one of the big things that got people to fail their interview was if their paperwork did not look clean. One thing that I recommend personally is not only have your logbook, but take your logbook and take it to a, a professional printing store and have them print a clean looking version of your logbook. This is because a lot of us don't have the best handwriting, you know what I mean? So your logbook tends to be messy and it tends to not be the most legible. So make sure that you also bring your logbook, obviously, but then have a clean booklet ver version of your logbook printed by whatever printing store you go to for your interview that allows the interviewers to easily go over your paperwork and see what you're working with, you know what I mean? This will help. Little details like this help significantly. The other thing you want to do is when you have your interview for the majors, you want to do a lot of research on the company that you're going to work for. So if you're going to go work for United, do a lot of research on United. Find out how United started. What are United's company goals? What makes United different from other airlines? You know, same thing for Delta, same thing for Americans, same thing for FedEx. You know, FedEx has a very interesting origin story that you guys should look into if you want to go to FedEx. When you go to your interviews, they are more than likely going to ask you, why do you want to work for XYZ airline? And it'll be excellent if you have done your research and you can say, well, I love this, this, this about the company because it makes them different from X, Y, and Z. And because of that, I feel like I'd be an excellent fit because I can bring this, this, and that to the table, which not only aligns with the company goals, but mine as well. You know, when you can give a genuine, well thought over answer, it'll really help increase your odds of absolutely killing the interview. The other thing you want to do when you're doing your interview is pay attention to the person who is interviewing you. Okay, so here's what I mean. You walk into the interview, you sit down, and typically there'll be one or two pilots and usually an HR person, or it'll be like within, you'll talk to them throughout the day. And it almost happens every time they will introduce themselves and they will tell you a little bit about them. Remember this, remember what they tell you about themselves. Once you go through the interview with them, at the end, they'll ask you, hey, do you have any questions? This is where you strike back. The first thing you want to do is say, hey, you know, I remember earlier you talked about X, Y, and Z. Um, you know, 
I, I like that too. Like, how does that, how, how, how did you get into that? Blah, blah, blah. It, it could be so simple. If they said, yeah, hey, you know, I, I like to fish in my free time. So, oh, you know what? I actually love fishing. You know, what got you into fishing? Or if they didn't give, give you anything to work off of, say, you know, yeah, I'm curious what got you interested in working for X, Y, and Z airline. And then listen to what they have to say. And from there, build a conversation. Because when you do this, this will help kind of differentiate yourself from all the other candidates because you'll have an actual human conversation with them about their career and about their life. And anytime you can get somebody to talk about themselves, that will really help score you points for your interview. I've used this for almost every single interview that I've done and it's never failed me. So again, one of my personal tips that I recommend, some may say it works, some may say it doesn't, but for me, it's been pretty successful. Two more things you want to think about when you're doing your interview. Big one is do not be cocky and do not be arrogant. Again, I say I've seen many people lose out on the opportunity of a career of a lifetime because they came into the interview being very cocky and very arrogant and very full of themselves. And I promise you that if this is the attitude that you have, you will be quickly humbled. And if you get humbled during your interview, I can almost guarantee that you will not get hired. So please, if you are somebody who is uh, like that, correct it before you go to the interview. Because remember that this is also a personality test. They're looking to see whether or not you are somebody who they'd want to fly with. And if you do not check that box, you have severely decreased your chances of getting hired by the major you want to be at. So don't mess it up now. And, and if you are the kind of personality who is very arrogant or very cocky, consider just and working on that in general because no one wants to fly with that kind of guy. No one to. And just keep that in mind. Y'all know who you are. I'm not being shady but y'all know who you are. And the last thing you want to think about when you do your major airline interview is you want to consider the colors of the company, right? So whatever are, whatever are the big, bold colors of the company, consider conservatively working that into your suit. So if one of the main colors of your airline is blue, you know, maybe wear uh, a blue suit. And if their other color is red, maybe wear a red tie, you know? Think of ways to very subtly work it into your appearance. Now, do not go all out. Like, don't don't try to be the, the most flashiest dressed person there. That's not what you're trying to do. Conservatively work these colors into your outfit. If you can't, like, if they have, like, a really bold color and you can't figure out how to work it in there, then maybe don't risk it. But if they have, you know, very good, not good, but traditional colors, then yeah, figure out a way to kind of work it into there as subtly as possible because just little stuff like that kind of helps with the after step. There's no proof that that does anything, but again, I've used that on all of my interviews and it always has worked for me. Passing the interview is a multi-step process that involves a lot of preparation and it is not something that you want to mess up on. So guys, if you do all of that correctly, then congratulations because you just got hired at the major airline of your choice. And now it's time to figure out how to manage all that money. But that's gonna be in a different video. And I'd like to add also that, you know, I put up my social media a couple of times throughout the video because I want you guys to know that it is absolutely okay to add me and reach out to me and ask me questions, 100%. Um, if you have questions about whatever process you're going through in the flying world and you want some answers, please reach out. You know, I put it down there for a reason. Reach out, shoot me your questions, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Um, you can also leave them in the comment section. I set up my YouTube so that I will get notified if you guys have questions and I'll ask them as soon as I can. So yeah, guys, like, comment, subscribe, all that jazz. I will see you next week on the next video that we're gonna have. And that's gonna be a very interesting video. See you guys.